During a two-week ministry trip across Ireland over Easter 2022, I had the privilege to meet and interview some Christian friends and acquaintances from both North and South of the island, with both Catholic and Protestant backgrounds, all of whom have come to a living faith in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Special thanks to Ronan, Alma, Wayne, Anne-Marie, Margaret, Jim and Gary. These are their stories. It would have been a general, you know, typical uh, Irish Catholic family. You know, we, you went to Mass uh, most Sundays, um, Easter time, uh, Christmas and so on. So for me, it was, um, it, it was the normal thing. You know, you just grow up with it. Confirmation was a standout for me, and that was the first time I really, I believe I experienced something of God in that. And... That is my earliest memory of um, a connection with God on that day. Um, and I never forgot that. The whole thing with confession for me, you know, to go into a box and to confess my sins to another man, it just, it didn't make sense, you know, why I needed to do that. I know confession is good, um, but, you know, it just really confused me. Um, you know, I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, he's just as... As, uh, as sinful as I am, you know, why, why do I need to do this? But later on, you know, one of the things that struck me in God's word is where it says that there's only one mediator between God and man, and that, uh, that is the God man, Jesus Christ. My upbringing was Methodist church, and it was very strong in, in where I was from, which is West Limerick. And I went to Sunday school every Sunday. I was brought up in the church. My mother was a strong believer. My father, not so much, which caused a bit of friction. But we always went as children. And I had two brothers, and they went as well. Um, we learned all the stories. We went out after the first two hymns and the prayer. And um, I, I actually loved going to church. I, I, I believed from the beginning, you know, that there was a God and he loved me. I was brought up in the Roman Catholic Church locally and uh, a Catholic school. And um, that's how it was for a number of years. So on a regular basis, we went to Mass every Sunday and it was uh, um, something we had to do. Every Sunday we, we couldn't miss it. We kind of practice out of duty more than anything else. But um, my family background was um, just the average background, the same as anybody else's. But um, on Sunday then, we were so well dressed that we looked very wealthy because we had to look nice for the priest. I actually remember the, the communion, the actual day I made the communion, and I was more interested in how much money I could make. And I actually made 80 pounds, which was a lot of money. I was mainly brought up Catholic. So um, in my family, we had, had a large family. So uh, we had nine in my family, but there was 13 in our house, including my grandparents. Mm -hmm. So it was a big family, but also on my mother's side, they had um, nuns and they would have had a Christian brother as well. So coming from that kind of perspective. So I would have been go to school, Catholic school. I would have learned my prayers at night um, including Hail Mary and um, the Our Father, and we were brought to church on the Sunday, and you made sure or, uh, when you went to Mass, and um, there was confession, and you did all your like your communion, your um, the confirmation as well. So yeah, I guess my kind of thing was I'd believe in God, but didn't know Jesus or that He was a living God. I was brought up in a good, good loving family, but it was Church Ireland I was being brought up. Uh, and that would be kind of what it would be. Uh, believed in God, but God, you know, it wasn't to the forefront. You went to church every Sunday and listened to something that you didn't understand and walked out of, down the back down the, out the aisle of the church and wondered what was all that about and, but believed in God like you know and you followed the rules uh, that would be a short 
version of life, even all through from childhood to teenage years. And it was a duty to go to church and go out for the hour and be seen at church, and then that was your duty done. I believed there was a God, but I had no real time for church. Okay. From that, it, it grew, and I went to the Presbyterian Church, but again, there was nothing to it. Like it was just something to do on Sunday morning. I was brought up as Church of Ireland. My dad was Church of Ireland. My mum would have been Methodist before she married dad, but it's a common thing for the wife to take on, you know, go to the same church as the husband. So we would have been brought up Church of Ireland, which was very traditional type church. And your brought up behaviour patterns was probably, you know, holiness, living correct lives would have been the one thing being saved wasn't really talked about in the Church of Ireland. I would never have heard a sermon on being saved. But um, loving God was definitely there. We learned the catechisms and uh, how we belong to God and how God died for us. We understood the gospel, but it wasn't preached very often. My husband also brought up in the Church of Ireland, but when we, came, when we got married, we joined the Presbyterian Church then. So we had both of those, and then we, we were part of the Presbyterian Church for 40 years really but it is a really behavior pattern I would honestly say is a good Christian behaved well. I grew up in a would have been a Methodist church Methodist background you know so that was the family I grew into um, grandparents I had a very godly grandmother so I had grown up um, went to Sunday school knew the Bible from a very young age was taught the was taught the Bible you know so knew the scriptures well we had Sunday school every Sunday church and halfway through the service we'd go out to Sunday school you know and then we obviously had our Sunday school teacher so I had a great grounded knowledge uh, from a godly godly family you know we went to a national school in Balintra which was um, yeah they, they would have taught the Bible and at Christmas time we did all the nativity and the services you know uh, religion was taught at school you know okay. but it was all scripture based religion yeah there was a drifting away from you know organized religion for me you know, where I didn't want to go to mass um, still believed in God and um, but it was no more than that so it was a time in my life I was in my 20s I was with in a relationship with a girl and um, things were going fine and uh, one day that completely changed where she didn't love me anymore and my, my world uh, my world fell apart so to speak mm -hmm. and the outside Ronan looked fine but inside I, I was I was broken I was searching mm -hmm. um, really just questioning life actually at that moment. It was quite a significant time for me. Um, it was probably a time that, yeah, I definitely felt there was a kind of a depression there or something. I just started to give up in life. The next stage was I actually moved out of my parents' house, decided to stand on my own two feet. I moved into a house with complete strangers. Didn't know anybody there, but there was one person and she was different to anyone I'd ever met. She had a peace and a joy about her that uh, I did not have, but I wanted what she had. Mm -hmm. um, and through evening conversation, I discovered she was a Christian. In the comfort of the home uh, I was living, um, I was able to ask all the questions I wanted to, uh, wanted to know more about. What did Jesus mean about being born again? Oh, you know, about sin and repentance and so on. And a few weeks later, she gave me a Bible. So I began reading, but as I found myself reading, I found myself also praying to this God that says he knows me and he desires for me to come to him. Um, and just the truth of what Jesus spoke um, really awoken something in me that I could see there was an emptiness in me and the world was empty and the things that I sought after, um, there was an emptiness about them too. But through the course of a few weeks, I just began to grow more and more uh, in love with God and the things of God. It was a realization that, that hit me, was that there was something that separated me from God, and it was sin. But sin was what stopped me coming from to my Heavenly Father. This is why he sent Jesus. And I knew what, in that moment what I needed to do. Do a U-turn and come back to God and put away my old life. 
uh, I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. The next morning I came down my housemate knew something radically had happened to me that night. It was a beautiful day, the sun was shining in the kitchen and it was like all the burdens, all the, the condemnation, everything that the world would be down with was suddenly gone. I was free. There was peace in my mind. There was joy set in my heart. And it went on. Um, that was just the start. Uh, a few months later, I, I knew I wanted to be baptized. It's not like somebody told me to do it. Jesus gave us the example. He was baptized himself, and I had a dream. And in that dream, Jesus brought me to a river and I was baptized. But I got baptized, washed away my old life and my sin. And I had another experience with God, maybe six months later, mm -hmm. where he came one night, he healed me. And I began, I was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in heavenly language. And it was amazing. Now I knew God, I knew he was real. And, mm -hmm. you know, previous to that, I believed in him. Mm -hmm. But now I knew him and there was a difference. When I was a teenager, um, things started to go wrong in my life in that um, my friend drowned and I was with her. So... I lived, you know, but I called out to God. But it's, it's one thing to say to someone, but I was with her, you know, and I couldn't save her. And uh, I called out to the Lord when I was drowning. I actually asked him to take me to heaven to forgive my sins because I didn't think I was getting out. I was in a terrible state. I used to go into my room and just, um, I used to just pray because no man could help me at that time. There was no joy in living. I just knew I needed help, mm -hmm. and it wasn't in man. God came and he did help me. Mm -hmm. It became really clear to me that time when I called out to the Lord, when I was 16, 17, yeah. 18, and as I was going along to these places where I was hearing the gospel. Well, my faith is so important to me. It's 100% important. Without the Lord, I would not be here. But as I started getting into my late teens, I started experiencing life without the church and um, I kind of enjoyed it and I wanted it so I stayed away then from the church but every now and again I would go back. As I got older then I thought, no, I don't want it. So I moved away from it. Um, God was always in the background. Looking back at it now, it was like a jigsaw puzzle. There were small pieces being added to my life, like God was putting small pieces into my life. Um, I got involved in the wrong crowd of people. I moved to London. I was in London for about 10, 11 years. Um, I got involved with the wrong crowd of people, very uh, shady, angry people. Um, I got involved in drugs. So I spent a lot of time uh, smoking drugs and taking them and stuff like that, lots of drinking and um, I just began to notice that even though I was get going darker and darker into situations and with people, I couldn't get myself out of it and I couldn't stop because it was a bit of a roller coaster slide. I remember watching the, the, the Christians, they were doing a play and it was a, a kind of like a gospel and kind of demonic play and I thought that's a good way of putting it across because it kind of hit me a little bit harder and a small old lady just came up to me and she handed me a small leaflet, yellow leaflet. So I began to open the leaflet and John 3 verse 3 was the first thing I mentioned and it was uh, Jesus chatting to a guy called Nicodemus and Jesus I tell you truthfully you have to be born again and it just hit me. I thought hang on, Jesus said this. And then I just read bits and pieces and John 3, 7, he says it again, two different sections. And I thought, what does that mean? So I turned over the leaflet and it began to explain. And I knew there and then that this is true. And the very first image that hit my head, I could, the first time ever, I actually saw Jesus slightly standing above me in my own experience. And he said, it's you I'm talking to. I ran home. I mean, went home fast. I went upstairs and into my bedroom and I fell down on my knees. There and then surrendered. And after, I remember standing back up and I felt brilliant. My experience, I felt the very same 
as you know when you buy a brand new pair of, of runners and you're wearing them and you kind of feel that walking on air and that's what I felt like inside I felt clean I absolutely felt spotless clean and I hadn't a care in the world so many months after that then I was uh, baptized and uh, that was a great experience I know my experience, I know who I met, I know who spoke to me and uh, he is 100% real and I experienced the real Jesus, not the world's view but I actually met him and uh, when you have that Christ experience it does change you. In my early 20s I started, once I moved out of home and there was no real hold on you so I, I moved away from it. I had what I would call an agnostic belief in God because you're, you're, you have an idea of God but you don't really know him. So you'll only reach for him if there's a problem. And for myself personally, I'd had a lot of just relationship uh, that it had fall, uh, fell apart. And I obviously was living outside of the will of God as well and just accepting the world's viewpoint or society's uh, viewpoint of like, you can get into a relationship, you can sleep with whoever you, you want and there's no repercussions or consequences. But as today I know, I know that there is consequences for that. But for me at that time I was ended up, I was carrying depression but not calling it depression. I was carrying anxiety but not calling it anxiety. And um, I just had to, I, I left to go to um, do, pursue another um, and in my dream of traveling and it for a time when I arrived in New Zealand it really I really did feel like I could actually do it on my own enjoy myself um, but that didn't last long because I ended up meeting other people uh, meeting other men and getting involved and there was a brokenness that was starting the, the cracks were really starting to appear because anxiety and panic attacks started coming because I searched for this love even in books. I searched to get mended in self-help books. I searched for my future in tarot cards and in horoscopes. I searched everywhere for hope for that there was something down the line. I wanted to know who I was. There was a lot of fear there, a lot of um, just yeah, I just was scared, yeah, and not knowing and being lost and having no purpose. I really started to sense that I was coming to the end of myself. I was in the middle of winter and I was walking up a dark street and I could just, just sense the hopelessness and thinking, I just want to go up in the top of that building and jump off. Which one will I do it? And I know that the Lord was with me because I could sense him saying to me, there is hope, Amory, there's hope. And even though I'm in that situation where I'm not living for God, God loves me and I know that he looked out for me and he saw me in the midst of my misery and my brokenness and my loss. He still had a heart for me because that to me, now as I look at it, is the father heart of God. Even though you may rebel against him, even though you may turn away from him, he loves you, he loves us, he loves us, and all he wants us to do is to turn to him. And I was seeking all the love in the wrong places, in the wrong people, and he just wanted me to turn to him. I just thought, I said, help me Jesus. And never before had I said those three words so heartfeltly or even sought Jesus may have been help me God but it was help me Jesus that name has power my love was machinery tractors if I had a wheel when I was 10 or 11 I was helping my father on the country mowing he worked in the country and I just loved it and again got away left school at 14 and just out on machinery driving and I kept working on and on and then I took over the business and worked hard and loved machinery but it wasn't working out but I kept burying the head in the sand to eventually 
I just had to give up the machinery and get rid of these nice shiny tractors and machinery. To me, things weren't sitting right with me and I couldn't, couldn't understand what was wrong, but I just wasn't in a happy place. Then, now don't get me wrong, I wasn't contemplating anything serious, but I just, my life wasn't right. And one day, going for, to the quarry for a load of stones, I just stopped the lorry and asked God to, to help, you know. And that's the first time I ever turned to God, like, you know, just through that, I asked God to help. And there were a healing service on the Presbyterian Church, and God intervened, sitting in the pew, and the minister, or the people that were doing the healing, asked, was there anyone who wants to come up and ask, ask for healing? And I was, wished I was glued to the seat. I didn't want to go up like that. But you often hear people saying about these two voices, one saying, go up, you need this, one saying, no, you don't need it. Eventually I went up, and... This, the words the minister, pa pastor said was, let, let this man know his sins are forgiven. And that's just like a light bulb went on in here. And I could have danced down to this pew again. And I could not believe the, the weight that was lifted of me for all the past things that I had done in my life was just gone. That power of Jesus in your life. So I would genuinely have given my life to God as an early, as a small child and confirmation would have been a serious thing. After all these years um, in church, we did know the gospel, but because there was little um, talk about Holy Spirit, really the Holy Spirit was not in the church that we would have went to. Um, now he was mentioned in passing here and there, but we never experienced the Holy Spirit really. I hadn't really dedicated my life to Christ in that sense, that he would have been number one. He wouldn't. He would have been slid in somewhere. The change really came two years ago at the beginning of the first lockdown for COVID virus, where we were locked down at home. The Spirit came upon me in some way because suddenly I, I started to have dreams. The Holy Spirit gave me a real thirst for the Word. I couldn't wait to get up every morning just to get into the Word. Um, he would talk to me during the night. I would be waking at three o'clock in the morning. Um, he seemed to open everything. Suddenly I understood things I never understood before. And he brought me back to the beginning. I saw Jesus in one of my dreams and it started off, that was early on. Jesus came to me, I knew it was him. He had a big box with a gift and he said to me, Margaret, I have, this is my gift for you. All these things in this box are available to you. There was a big bonnet with my name and all my details of birth and everything. And he says, there was a list of all he'd done for me. And he said, you can have some of it or all of it, but I really would like you to have all of it. So I understood in my dream that this was to do with the Holy Spirit and the gifts and all this sort of thing that wasn't available in the church really through what our normal experience was. And I realized after a bit that my view of God was completely wrong, that God is always loving. God is always holy, but God is also a forgiving, loving God. Just before I started secondary school, I had a bad accident which on a go-kart and I fractured my left leg, you know, and um, I broke it right on the growth plate, completely shattered the, completely shattered the bone and the surgeon told my mum I didn't know at the time that I would be left with a short leg, you know, because um, it had been so badly damaged. But about two months in, on an outpatient's appointment, he was looking at the at the X-ray, you know, and he's, he he said, told me, "Mummy said it's a miracle that uh, it, it started growing again," you know. So that was my first miracle, you know. And as I said, I never doubted God's existence, you know. However, the world took me away, so on and so forth. I suppose, like a lot of young people, you go, you know, you have other interests at heart. Motorbikes was my big interest, so I started pursuing that, you know.
Yeah, okay. and sort of drifted away from church, especially up in, right from 16 really. I was in Australia, I've been in Australia for a good few years, and I just got to a point in my life where I was really down, feeling lost, no purpose in life, you know, and that's when I started actually going back to a church. Uh, to be honest, having done all the partying and had, like, like I've done everything from bungee jumping, jumping out of planes, motorbikes, you know, fast cars, speedboats, really everything life had to offer, you know, and um, so there's nothing else I can try, but I knew there's something, something badly missing, you know. Why I'm now faced with this emptiness or hollow or this nearly, I wouldn't say suicidal feelings, but that just like no purpose in life, you know, that was the real, that was just the crux of it, you know. So I, I said, you know what, was, I just felt it's, I'll start going back to church, so which I did there. And as was the first few Sundays there, um, I just felt really at home again. I'd been back in Ireland probably about... Um, 10 days at the stage and I was really, where am I going, what am I doing? Um, I met a guy on the road uh, who was a minister and he asked me did, did I believe in heaven and hell? I said I did. I wouldn't be so righteous as to say I'd go to heaven. Off I went, I went to the meeting that night and my mum came with me as well and uh, yeah, I got a, a baptism in the Holy Spirit conviction, you know, and, and from that really life just completely uh, turned around 180. When you have heard the, ex the expression, the fear of God, okay. that was certainly there, you know, and it was just basically, you know, uh, you know, uh, accepting Christ or rejecting Christ, you know, and, and I was left with that choice and it was very clear to me, you know, it was black and white, you know, and I had a decision to make. And I, uh, and this is how gracious the Lord is, you know, he brought me to that point so graciously, you know, having experienced and lived the life that I lived, he brought me to that point where I was very clear in my mind, there was no other satisfaction. It's an everyday thing, you know, it's a choice trying to, to be the person that God wants you to be and to lead by example. This should be outworked in our day-to-day -day lives mm -hmm. where we, we want to help people, we want to love on people and, and show them the love of God. So it starts um, in the home, in the family home. Um, you know, and, and, and speaking truth and life over my children and within work, it's, you know, opportunities to pray with people, to speak truth, um, to help people and showing them how to live this new life. It's so important to me now because I find life is very challenging and there's, there are a lot of challenges. It is difficult having four children, which I have. They're grown up, I know, but they still have needs. So it's, I'm always turning back, have to turn to the Lord. I meet up with people a few times a week. I'm living it out as, as best I can. Um, I'm work in progress, still working away. My walk with Jesus is, 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 is more and more mature and it is getting stronger and stronger. I play out my Christian duties more with my wife and children, especially with my children, because I want them to have that foundation. Now I'm at the stage where I am praying for others. I am looking out for others that may be coming in. I am telling people um, the testimony of my life when I see that they're broken. I pray for people. I would pray now about everything much more. It's not a chore. It's not something you do because you have to. And um, the word is so much more important now because you want to learn so much more. It's just the desire for God has changed more than anything else, I think. You also want to share him with people. That has definitely happened big time. And I have found that the shop has been a place where people connect as well. I have a passion to share that with as many people as I can because I truly believe uh, after we die, um, you know, it's um, eternity with the Lord or there's a, a lost eternity. That's, that's what I believe, you know. So I certainly have a passion to share that with as many people as I can. We're not called to live out this life on our own, that we're we are Jesus' body here on earth. We need one another. We need to be part of a community. What does that look like? You know, for some people who've grown up, it's, it's, it's this church thing, this, you know, the system that they feel they have to go to a certain place and a certain day of the week at a certain time. I don't see that in the Bible. I see a group of people who really love each other and they're just sold out for the gospel. I'm very involved in a Christian community, that's my strength, that's what helps me keep going. 
as time went on, I, I just felt a need for more than what I was getting in the Church of Ireland, if you like. I just, more depth and so on. And the Lord led me to the group in Ross Grey. I just loved it because they were really into, you know, studying the word, praying, um, just the gifts and so on. And there was more than what I was used to in the traditional churches. It's about a family of Christ where we're, we're called not to forget the assembly of your people. Um, no men's an island, that's what people say. Um, it is personal. I do uh, do it myself in my, my own private time. But when you're working with people of the same faith, it is, it's family. They are your brothers. They are your sisters in Christ. They hold each other up. It is another family. And it is a family that have the same Holy Spirit that's in you is in them. And you can connect. And as the Bible says, where two or more are gathered together, Jesus is there. And I got the sense of what it is to be in a family of God, really getting to know the family of God. And I still get strengthened by the family of God, still to this day. We have a monthly house meeting now and we get together with other believers and it really strengthens you. It's like uh, watering a, a plant. You, you've got to have people around you that uh, you can share your beliefs with and strengthen you, you know, and to do the things that God wants you to do, like, you know, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. There is a real community who are seeking him that God has brought me into now, and I can see that their ideas, they want something much deeper than what they've been brought up with. And there's quite a lot of people leaving the traditional churches. Um, it's sad in one way, but we get past the tradition and we realise each individual belongs to God. And I think that's how Jesus always worked. We are part of a, of a Christian community. There's quite a few of us here and um, quite a few, uh, um, I, I do go around quite a few of the churches here, you know. We build each other up, you know, in our faith, praying together, we, we grow stronger. It's relevant uh, today as it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus walked this earth. It is the only hope that we have. This world is empty. Um, we can put our hope in a lot of things, but they're so superficial and temporary. But Jesus is, is in all and is everything. And there's such a great need for the truth of the gospel. And it's the truth that sets people free. Otherwise, you could be bound in stuff that's not the truth. We're in a battle, in a spiritual battle, for, you know, this nation and for the, the future of this nation and our children and the young people who are desperately needing the truth at this time. And I know it's according to his will to see this country saved and to see people turn back to him. And there's such a need for true Christianity in this country. The most important thing for our country, absolutely the gospel. In this country, people are looking for the truth. We're always being lied to and people know they're being lied to. It's, we're in darkness, people are looking for the truth. And um, the truth is there. And the truth is in the gospel. The gospel does save lives. It opens people's eyes and it brings great joy to people. And um, I, for one, I'm holding on to the gospel. Ireland needs freedom. We have got so much sickness in this country. Psychologists don't have the answer. They don't. Uh, their answer is tablets. Tablets isn't uh, going to solve the root of your problem. The root of the problem is spiritual. People need to know this. They need to know that they can get free from all of their drug addiction, their alcoholism, their um, sexual immorality, living for themselves, selfishness. The gospel is the most important thing in, this, in Ireland, and it, uh, there's a big, big need for it, like, you know, uh, but uh, definitely the gospel is needed. Someday we are going to meet our maker, and the gospel and Jesus is the only way 
that we are going to have eternal life. And there's no other way. And if we don't have the gospel and know that God is, in, is there and we are safe and him and COVID or a heart attack or a brain tumour or anything can take us. But when we have the gospel, we're not afraid of death. I think it's just as important now as ever it was. I think we're just as lost and so many people just as lost as ever there were. I think there's only one answer and that is Jesus for all situations. I do believe it's very much alive and I think that's what I've come to understand most of all, that my relationship with Jesus is a personal one. And then you join as a personal saved person with other people into the kingdom of God, in God's kingdom. And so the, the relationships are totally different. You're not no longer having to follow to keep everyone happy. It's in God's kingdom. Jesus now is the number one, not a denomination or a group or whatever. It's Jesus and only Jesus. There's certainly a need for it. Like we look at our society, you know, uh, deaths and sickness and suicide and murder, you know, and it's getting closer and closer to home all the time, you know. So there's definitely a need for it. Christ is the key to eternal life, you know. Uh, there's more to life than this. We've, you know, our bodies are, you know, we're all going to die. We know that, you know. And I just feel for those who don't have Christ, there's no hope, you know, what you live this life. And like I've lived it to the max that I thought it was and I could find no purpose in it. So there's certainly a need for it, you know. Jesus came to, to rescue you. He died for you. And he wants for you to know him. He really desires that. Well, I'm just thinking of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Because there is a heaven to gain and a hell to lose. I think that's the words. But people are going to go to one place or the other, depending on whether they accept Jesus as their saviour or not. And he has paid for their sins. And he's happy to pay. He, he's happy for everyone to, to know that and to live that. But if people choose, no, I'll pay for my sins. Well, that is so foolish. I have a living hope because the Lord has risen from the dead. He's not dead. He's alive in heaven. When you experience Jesus for yourself, he's the most amazing, most loving, most caring person you will ever come across. He knows you more than you know yourself. He is so in love with you that he was willing to come away from his father, come down to the earth, be put on a cross, and if he could do it again, just for you only, he would do it for you. There's nobody else on this planet that you can trust. But Jesus Christ is the only person who will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Jesus loved us so much. And Lord, the Lord God, Father God, the great creator, the great almighty, loved us so much, even though we sinned against him. The children of Israel sinned against him. The Irish people sinned against him. But he sent his only son to die for us on that cross. He spilled out every last drop of blood out of that cross to cleanse us of all our sins and all our wrongdoing and all our shame and all our guilt. Because there's so much guilt in this world, but my goodness, how he cleanses us when we come to him and repent of our, our sins and our wrong living. He, he gives us that life, that freedom. He puts our, his Holy Spirit inside of us and he frees us and he gives us life everlasting. He loves you and no matter what you've done, if you look to Jesus and ask him for forgiveness and believe in him, that he can have the same as me. It's a gift for every one of us, like you know, and it's free. It's there for everyone, like you know. That's how, you know, that's what I want to tell and uh, go out and and pr spread that good news that it's there for each one of us, like you know, uh, and the peace that that brings us. This, you know, 
It's amazing. I would just ask them, do they know Jesus? And usually they would sort of say, well, yeah, I know about Jesus. They often would say it that way. They know about Jesus. But then I would bring it further and say, well, do you know him personally? Do you talk to him? And then, you know, mm, it's sort of the prayer thing. They would think about the prayer thing rather than talking to Jesus. And they would, um, I would sort of bring it further, then sort of said, uh, do you realize or do you know that Jesus is your saviour, you know, that he died for your sins? It's good news. Christ came to, to save the sinners, to save the world, you know, um, and um, that he loves each and every one of us. God love, God is love. That is the essence of the gospel, you know. Um, God created everything in perfection, but unfortunately uh, we've, we've messed it up, you know. But he's, he's given us a way back through, through his son's sacrifice and that uh, by accepting him, uh, we have eternity with him. I got COVID at the end of 2020, and I thought, right, nothing to worry about. But eventually, after a battle at home, I went to the doctor and sent to Letterkenny Hospital. Just straight into the theatre and a mask on. And that was a Thursday night, Friday morning. I remember the doctor coming in across the bottom of the bed, just up to me, a very direct doctor. And she says, you one very sick man. Yeah, yeah, right. That's what I needed to hear. But uh, then they said, you'll probably have to go up to intensive care. And uh, you might have to be incubated. I think that's the right word, incubated. But uh, I remember when they were wheeling me up from uh, the war or the private room to ICU, I remember in my head saying that, Jim, this is either going to go one or two ways. I'm either going to go and be with God or go home to Margaret and the family. But either way, I'm safe. I am washed the most in the blood of Jesus. I have no call to worry, to know that no matter what happens, you're safe, you're with Jesus. I remember turning around the first night and over the doorway was the crucifix of Jesus on the cross and what, they, what he has come through and I am safe with you Jesus. And then I would re recite my favourite verse with Philippians 4.13, I can do all things. And I went with the help of God from strength to strength. The first checkup I got, uh, I was, it was an x-ray in the lungs and I said the lungs seem to be perfect, there's no problem with them. Then in July, we went, they had arranged a breath test and I went over for a breathing test and the, the consultant says, you, you must be very fit, she says, you're Tests come back at 110% for somebody my age. And that's thanks to the glory of God, He restored me, like, you know. It's nothing else, like, you know. And, uh, from that on now, I, that's how Jesus is working in my life. These Irish people are a living witness to the reality that the Gospel is alive and bearing fruit in Ireland. From a range of religious and personal backgrounds, they have come to a clear understanding of the gospel and they have personally experienced the love and presence of Jesus Christ in their lives. It really is amazing to hear how God has met each of them in the personal circumstances and challenges of their lives and drawn each of them to himself in a completely unique and individual way, yet with a common theme and story. That God is real and is lovingly reconciling people to himself through Jesus Christ. This could be your story too. You can know and experience the love and presence of God in and through Jesus Christ. This is the amazing gospel, the good news, and it's for everyone in the world. During this journey, I've used a picture cross to explain the gospel message to people across Ireland. It's a simple way of sharing the gospel using pictures and symbols much like the way the early Celtic Christians did from the Celtic picture crosses. 
This is the message of the picture cross. Creation. God is love and is the creator. He created us in his likeness for a relationship of love and harmony. Fall. But we have gone the wrong way, resulting in separation from God's holy presence and with terrible consequences. Old way. God has not left us in darkness, but sent the prophets to show that he was making a way of reconciliation possible through the substitute lamb, who in taking the penalty and price for sin opens a way for us to experience the love and presence of God again. Jesus. Of course, all of this was pointing to the one who was to come, Jesus Christ. He became the real and perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world, the Lamb of God. Spirit. Following his death, resurrection and ascension to heaven, he poured out the Holy Spirit in a new and greater way, resulting in thousands becoming followers of Jesus and the gospel spreading across the nations. Growing. And still today, people all over the world, from every ethnic and religious background, are coming into a living faith in Jesus and experiencing the life and power of the Holy Spirit in their own lives. In and through them, the gospel of Jesus is growing and bearing fruit all over the world, including here in Ireland. And this gospel is for you also. You can know and experience the love and presence of God in your life. God is drawing people back into a personal and living relationship with him, true faith in the person and gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to know more about the gospel, you can explore it further by prayerfully reading or listening to the gospels and the New Testament for yourself, or find believers whom you know and trust and ask them to help and assist you in your search for true spiritual life. If you want to experience the love of God and his power in your life, then this prayer of faith may assist you. Lord God, Jesus Christ, I believe in you and your gospel. I want to know you and experience your grace, love and power in my life. I put my trust and faith in Jesus, in his life, words and works, that he died on the cross for my sins in my place and rose again. I admit that I have sinned and I seek your forgiveness. I turn away from sin and commit to live my life your best way. I commit to be baptized in water and I open my life to receive the gift and power of the Holy Spirit. I commit to grow in faith and love following you all the days of my life. Thank you for this new and living relationship with you through Jesus Christ, for being my Lord and Saviour and the gift of eternal life. Amen. If you are searching for God or have made a commitment to trust and follow Jesus, then please reach out and share your story with us at patricksmission.com.